Um, I want to introduce uh, Shalyn, who's going to be giving the presentation today, and I will make this presentation very brief. Um, she's an associate professor of informatics, uh, did her graduate work here, uh, got her PhD and master's degree here, uh, but we're both in comparative literature? Yes. Yeah, so you can talk to her privately or offline about how she made that jump into informatics. Um, she has a focus in her research on sociocultural computing, uh, humanistic and particularly feminist uh, HCI uh, and design, and uh, she directs the Cultural Research in Tech Lab here at IU. And uh, one of the things that I've connected to her and, and Jeff about, um, in particular, was some of their recent work on making and studying making an innovation in the U.S., China, and Taiwan. Um, and so, if we can welcome her and hear awesome things that she's got to tell us. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, um, to coming to my talk uh, today. I want to first thank Cindy for the invitation, and obviously Adam for um, a very generous um, introduction. Oh, let, me, let me stop you for one second. Okay. And by the way, <laughs> when you get on her website, I forgot to say this, she's got a very nice list of awards, grants, publications, really impressive and amazing, so you should go take a look at that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See, very generous introduction. <laughs> you need to be more. <laughs> okay, I, I do want to apologize. Um, it took us a while to try to get the screen not to stretch, um, but it's still stretching. So anyway, I do have a very beautiful deck. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, just a quick note about myself, just like what Adam um, just mentioned. I was trained in comparative literature, so I approach HCI, that's human-computer interaction, that's um, my current discipline, in ways that reflect my humanist background. And most of my work is about to kind of make visible and tease forward the sociocultural and political aspect of computing. So um, the lab, uh, the research lab, um, I uh, co-directed with my husband and colleague, Jeffrey Bartel, sitting in the audience. It's called Cultural Research in Technology Lab, um, in Technology Crit Lab, where we try to um, create a dialogue between criticality and HCI research and design practice. So one core feature of our lab is that we use a critical and empirical uh, methodology in all of our work. That is, we seek to combine critical stances and methods from critical theory, feminist theory, literary criticism, and philosophy of art. With empirical approaches, including multi-sided ethnography, contextual inquiry, um, a lot of the design methods, and, and feminist social science. So what does that look like in practice? Each epistemology tends to emphasize different aspects of what we are trying to understand. The empirical side grounds us, we hope, in reality. These methods help us maintain our ethical commitment to the actual practices and experiences of real people. Even so, it is not enough. The critical dimension helps us see beyond what we can directly observe and what users are able to tell us. We try to cultivate a subtle, even aesthetic appreciation for users' achievements while retaining a focus on what goes on set and the contradictions that get swept under the rug. So coming our work on the investigation of computational practices, that is, uses of computing, we especially focus on practices that are surprising or emergent. In other words, um, not what designers intended, yet of value. Areas of research are included the intimacy, sexuality, and health, aesthetic experiences, creativity and innovation, as well as sustainability. So this has manifested in dozens of individual studies on topics such as these. And often we use specific critical theories and philosophical constructs to help us interpret our observations in interview and ethnographic data. One strategy we use is to elicit narratives from research participants, which we then transcribe and analyze as if they were literary texts. On the slides, I list a few of the critical theories and philosophical concepts that we have used over the years so that you can get a sense of how these all kind of work together. So a um, few notes about today's talk. Many of us share an interest in making and the maker movement. 
Like many, I see much potential in making, and also some hype, exclusiveness, corporatism, Western centrism, and other ways that making fall short of this, his, its own stated agenda to democratize IT education and innovation. I see a role for research in offering account making that can attend to, uh, that can call attention to, and develop appreciation for alternative practices and edge cases that can counter some of making's unfortunate tendencies. It also revealed the complex interdependencies of making and other parts of society, which can help clarify ways that making is not likely to be transformative in hopes of finding some pathways where it can be a part of a positive social change. So today, using a critical empirical approach, I will walk through two such vignettes of making from our fieldwork in Taiwan. So one is a traditional Taiwanese cultural form, the puppet opera. The other is an urban renewal project in Taipei. And I'll show how making is implicated and actually shapes both. Um, by way of context, um, this work is supported by an NSF grant that look at the pathways that transform making from hobbyist pursuit to economic drivers. So, so far we have logged in hundreds of hours of ethnographic data. We have um, using um, a, a method common, uh, we common use in um, design discipline about this kind of co-design, co-creation, participatory design, where we work with hackers and makers to create uh, workshops and hackathons. Um, that's another kind of knowledge production. Um, we also have interviews, obviously, with makers and hackers, and also policymakers, government officials. We had tours. Um, several um, um, factories in China and Taiwan, um, and to actually get a sense of how these kind of um, kind of business environment actually shape the making and DIY entrepreneurial um, practices on the ground, and obviously we use a critical empirical approach to interpret the data. So I begin with a very basic question: What is making? So making, at least in human-computer interaction, HCI, refer to everyday users mani manipulating computational artifacts and hardware. It happens in fat labs, um, high school robot competitions, maker fairs, and through physical and electronic media, including mag magazines and instructables.com. Common maker tools include 3D printers, laser cutters, simple computer kits like Arduinos, and also common materials like um, office supplies, uh, metal, and fabrics, etc. Proponents claim that the making democratizes technology use, innovation, and entrepreneurship, leading to economic development and other societal benefits. It also serves as an educational pipeline into near-future technological change, including ubiquitous computing, Internet of Things, smart city, and smart homes. The popular media and academic research, both popular media and academic research, have gravitated towards two positions on making. First, there is the optimistic techno-utopian view in which making transforms society, improving all sorts of social problems. It is exciting and optimistic, but also a little bit hard to believe. Last naive is the critical view, which questions making's claims to bring about social change. The problem with the critical view is that it problematizing the whole agenda. So who's going to fund this? So we are faced with a dilemma where we seem forced to choose either a naive techno-utopian view or a self-defeating critical view. Both of these views get something right, something worth preserving and fighting for. In our work, we seek to deconstruct the dichotomy between the techno-utopian and critical views so that we can do making research that robustly pursues a democratizing agenda while remaining technically, critically, and empirically sophisticated. Our hope, then, is to discover and explore alternative ways of framing making as a research agenda for HCI, human-computer interaction. So let's take a look at the Maple movement in a little bit more analytical 
differently. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, common picture of the maker movement looks something like this. We had the technical practices, the descriptions, descriptions of practice, and descriptions of making application domains. And such a view sometimes is encapsulated and proposed as a kind of a global universal. This is the maker movement. And then instances of that begin to pop up all over the globe. For example, fat lab rights. If I walk into a fat lab in Russia, I should be able to do the same things that I can do in Nairobi, Cape Town, Delhi, Amsterdam, or Boston fat labs. This framing is appealing in that it obviously uh, it provides continuity and legibility across regions, languages, and cultures. But there's a problem with this picture. It describes making absent of any socio-political context. So we then ask, how can making democratize in the absence of politics? We need a different picture to do that work one where making is situated in a socio-political context. In that picture, instead of a global universal, we instead follow anthropologists on and Collier in viewing making as a global assemblage. Let's unpack that. Specific maker scenes participate in a global maker movement as one entanglement among many others. For example, any maker site is locally situated, what skills local makers have, what purposes they have for making, and what sociocultural practices they situate their making within, these are all part of it. But there's also an ideological context in which this unfolds, such as the notions that everyone can be a maker, or the idea that maker as a form of the entrepreneurial self. Making also unfolds in relation to emerging technologies, such as the elements and infrastructures of the Internet of Things or smart cities. And some of its particular practices cluster into recognizable and shareable forms, such as hackathons, fat labs, and instructables. Local and national government policies also shape maker practices, including financial support, censorship, and its own priorities. And all of, of course, all of this is situated in global flows of capital and the distinctive ways that such flows are enacted in the maker movement. And different maker assemblages uh, appear in different ways. For example, a fat lab in Chicago might look something like this. And an industry-sponsored hackathon in London might do something like this. By moving to a less essentializing and more socioculturally and politically situated view of making, which nonetheless still reflects its overall participation in the global maker train, we hope to better position to see oddities and exceptions. These then became, become raw materials out of which to start to perceive to imagine and to pursue meaningful alternatives beyond the standard narrative of the, the global maker movement. That's pretty abstract, so let's talk through a couple of examples. The first one is about puppets. So we begin by observing that making is framed in both research and popular me media in some common ways. It is an economic driver, um, an element of educational reform, and many of these frames link making to innovation and from there to economic growth. One such framing is the idea that making is a part of nation building, that is the pursuit of national growth, national security, and national flourishing. So we explore this issue in the context of Taipei, Taiwan. So again, our critical empirical study of making in Taiwan is intended to help us trouble and reframe predominant in theorizations of making in Western IT research. As most of you know, Taiwan is embroiled in a white hot debate about its relationship with China. Is Taiwan a part of China or independent from it? 
Since 1980, the self-governed island has become increasingly democratic, but also de de diplomatically and economically isolated as China seeks to force a reunification. Meanwhile, some of Taiwan's distinctive cultural forms, including handcrafts and types of performance, are dying out. Taiwan's political struggles, its cultural heritage, and the global IT agenda might seem unrelated. But what brings them together is their respective connections to economic development. Specifically, like many other countries, Taiwan has been pursuing the creative and cultural industry policies that seek to stimulate economic growth by means of its cultural and creative heritage. So it should not be surprising that making would be supported as part of a policy, a creative industry with economic upsides that can be pursued in distinctively Taiwanese ways. Yet there was, a, there was considerable debate about what it means to industrialize culture and how doing so best serves the interests of Taiwan. And the computational practice of making ended up in the thick of that debate. Again, recalling our research goal is to find meaningful alternatives to existing research framing of making. In this case, we are investigating a less common narrative of making, making as nation building. From there, we explore that the maker things in Taipei to understand how this narrative was concretized within those assemblages. And that brings us back to Taiwanese poppy opera, or Bu Dai Xi, which was a popular form of street theater throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. A typical performance elaboratively um, includes elaboratively decorated traditional stage, stylized performances, and handcrafted wooden puppets. Puppeteers undergo extensive apprenticeships in both performance and fabrication. They had to make all their puppets and the, the stages. So Chen Bojian um, is a master in that tradition, but he is also very well known in the Taipei maker scene. He has collaborated with maker groups to use emerging technologies to update the craft by combining traditional techniques with new ones. In this image, he stands in front of puppy opera stage that he built. In the past, the puppet master would painstakingly hand carve these stages over a period of years. Yet Chen Bojian created his using computer control laser cutter techniques, and he even went so far as to draw Fat Light Taipei's logo right in the middle of it. Chen is not just a puppeteer and maker, but also a political activist. He argues that Taiwan's creative industry policy has its priorities backwards. He says, Cultural and creative industry must exist to be in service of a Taiwanese tradition, not the other way around. Chen's perpetuation of Taiwanese puppet opera is insignificant from the standpoint of entrepreneurship and IT innovation. It tells us little about the Internet of Things or smart cities, or the outer limits of computational modeling. Instead, Chen occupies an odd spot in making, he is important in Taipei's maker scene, but mostly illegible to much of the global maker movement. But he's significant to us because his words suggest another meaning of making, the idea that making can be pursued as a technology of the national self. More recently, Chen has been part of a group that created the Taiwan Duino, a microcontroller in the shape of Taiwan. Through projects such as these, Chen links IT agendas to matters of civic life, how Taiwanese education teaches creativity and compu computer literacy, how policymakers balance cultural heritage and economic development, and how Taiwan's precision manufacturing industry continues to innovate in an era of outsourcing to China. Now making can be used in this way as a form of constructive participation in a struggling democracy's democracy offers a glimpse, however fragmented and imperfect, of the utopian. I will be returned um, to the idea of um, utopian at the end of the talk. 
So the first case is now is finished. And so I want to return here to the common frames of make, making slides I shared earlier. In the first case, I talk about making as nation building. Now I want to switch gears. And the second case I talked about today blends together two of the frames. The underlying idea is that by democratizing IT innovation, and by providing greater access to IT innovation and better pathways from ideas to entrepreneurship, that the increased innovation will lead to startups, some of which will succeed, creating new industries and new jobs, and with it, economic growth. That's an idea, at least. On the ground, things get a little bit more complicated, as we shall see. The case I want to share with you now is what happened on Treasure Hill, a micro community sitting precariously in literal and figurative ways on a riverside foothill on the edges of the downtown Taipei. Treasure Hill was illegally built in the 1940s as an anti-aircraft settlement in the outskirts of Taipei. By 2000, it was seen as a slum which had been swallowed up by an ever-growing Taipei. It was identified by the NGOs and the Taipei city government as an area needing urban renewal. Closed down in 2007 and reopened in 2010, it now hosts an uh, artist village, including one of Taiwan's most famous hackerspaces, Taipei Open Lab. The city was drawn to Treasure Hill because it has a fascinating cultural heritage. Yet it was also a slum filled with hundreds of squatters. Taipei city government decided to invest in Treasure Hill, clean it up, and recover this lost space for the city, giving it a new identity as an artist community. Reopened in 2010, Treasure Hill is a symbiotic art settlement bringing together a heterogeneous group of artists, investors, and tourists, along with some of the original residents. It is held forth as a case study of successful historical site preservation. It meets rising citizen demand for parks and, and other public quality of life facilities and for beautifying the city. Treasure Hill hosts Open Lab Taipei, one of the most successful makerspaces in the city, serving as a symbol of the creative economy on top of another symbol of the creative economy. But wait a minute, what happened to all those squatters? The city's story doesn't say much about them. Who were the squatters? This man is typical. He came to Taiwan from China in 1949, at the end of the Chinese Civil War, with the military as a young man, as you can see in the upper right corner, uh, upper left corner of, of the screen, and expected to go back home to the mainland one day as a veteran. Those hopes slowly dashed over decades, so he made a life in Taiwan as best as he could on Treasure Hill. He was forcibly evicted with the rest of its community. The image on the lower left shows the city taking a resident's belongings out of their home. We do know a fair amount about members of this community. The settlement was started by war veterans and low-income laborers at a nearby water utility plant. They numbered in the hundreds. And they had been on Treasure Hill for five decades, peaking at over 226 households and nearly 500 people in 1991. They sourced building materials from nearby riverbeds and streams, urban development, demolitions, and other sites. They fabricated a functioning water and sewage systems by hooking up discarded pipes to the nearby water plant. And because water pressure was low, they coordinated bathing and other water use. They farm vegetables and pigs. They even have a com communal babysitting system. The architecture is unique. Homes are packed in so tight and so organically that distinctions between walkways, porches, and roofs disappear. 
In short, they build a micro town, micro society, and functioning micro economy off the grid. This is the cultural heritage that the government was seeking to preserve the functioning colony, the quirkily appealing architecture, and of course, 50 years later, their prime real estate location in a now much larger Taipei. Protests, protests hindered the urban renewal project for years, before they were finally forcefully evicted in 2007. Less than 10% of the family that moved out returned in 2010. The initial intentions of the government were to create a symbiotic society in which the working poor stayed in Treasure Hill and were integrated into the art community in a meaningful way. The government also needed to modernize the buildings and utilities, which were not built to code, and were very dangerous in a country that is prone to major earthquakes and typhoons. The original plans to create the symbiotic community would have been among the first urban experiments of its kind in the world. But what happened? At some point, the plan shifted. The renovated land became very valuable. There was no room for the squatters in the renovated place. They were promised alternative public housing, but even that proved difficult for the city to develop to deliver. The irony is that the dispossessed, kicked out of Treasure Hill, embodied the same maker values that the system expropriated them in order to implement. They are makers in all senses that the government and the dominant media are celebrating as making. A citizen-made water utility service systems is an extremely impressive example of making. In creating a policy narrative around the creative economy and urban renewal, the government offered a set of principles, institutions, and procedures that structurally disable the articulation of the residents, making do, surviving as a squatter village, and making illegal infrastructure such as a, such as a water system are not part of the so-called creative economy. They don't create new business, they certainly don't create new jobs, so they become invisible. invisible. But the actual dialogue um, situation happened anyway through alternative structures, through protest and media coverage, academic research, and NGOs. And in, the, in that dialogue, the marginal voice were offered a powerful counter-narrative to the well-meaning city government narrative, and they reveal gaps and confounds in the city's narrative that problematize what happened on Treasure Hill as a policy initiative that meets the criteria set out by our values, such as democratizing technology and respect for every individual in virtue their, in their own humanity. The residents' counter-narrative shows that what counts as making must operate inside the dominant socioeconomic system in order to be making. That is, otherwise, identical acts, acts of creativity and value creation are treated in radically different ways. One is valorized as the way forward, and the other is eradicated. The odd consequences is that the residents, by being dispossessed of their homes on Treasure Hill and moved to legitimate housing, had their citizenship regained at the cost of starting at the bottom rung of society, but nevertheless within society. That is, they were made into citizens. So what got made on Treasure Hill? We have old pipes, unwanted materials, and rocks from the riverbed um, were made by squatters into a settlement hosting a semi-autonomous society. We have a rural hill that was made by squatters and time into architecturally and culturally distinctive and valuable real estate in Taipei City. We have a squatter settlement that was made by the government into an urban park and tourist attraction. 
and Arduino sensors and so on were made by makers and hackers on Treasure Hill today into maker projects in Taipei Open Lab, a symbol of Taiwan's new creative economy. And squatters were made by dispossession into legal citizens at the bottom rung of mainstream society and newly dependent on its logic for their survival. But to be fair, there was one complexity that must have been hard for the government to deal with. The squatters' lack of a clear legal status, the kind that the, the conventional property owners enjoy, put the squatters in a politically liminal position. Neither constituents and nor foreigners, and I think that's what happened to many immigrants um, in similar positions throughout the world today. And the government can very well act as though the squatters on Treasure Hill are an independent and autonomous nation. And that means, at the end, the government realistically can only had only had one choice. That is to recognize the squatters as citizens. But as soon as, as it did, the squatters lost all their de facto rights over the community and neighborhood. And the government did very little to compensate them for that loss. So Treasure Hill did not have a utopian outcome. So by way of a conclusion, though I haven't said so until now, the entire analysis is shaped by feminist theories of utopianism. Feminist utopianism rewards traditional utopian into a dem democratic and part participative practice that seeks to reimagine social aspirations and develop pathways to achieve them. It features two key moves, which I have used throughout these two cases. The first move is diagnostic critique in which the analyst explicate how social assemblages reflect hegemonic and otherwise non-utopian values. And the second move is anticipatory design, in which one offers glimpses of radically improved futures and woo the public with them. In the diagnostic critique, we consider how Western research theorizations of making are apolitical yet promised democracy. We then return to a concrete situation of real political struggle in Taiwan to see how making is called up in hegemonic discourses. That is, the Taiwan government's appropriation of the Silicon Valley view of making as an economic driver came at the expense of its own commitment to Taiwanese culture and heritage in the puppet opera example, and came at the expense of the very citizen makers it was seeking to support in the first place, as we saw in the Treasure Hill example. Our anticipatory design was situated in our ethnographies of makers. In our studies of Chen's puppet opera, we saw glimpses of political futures in which making, in some ways, was more democratic and participative than it seems to be in the ap apolitical Silicon Valley model that is generating so much excitement and funding today. In the Treasure Hill example, we saw how different social groups came together and were mobilized to a to point to and to protest the injustice of a well-meaning policy implementation that turned bad. I do not suggest that Chen's Poppy Opera or Treasure Hill is truly utopian. I merely suggest that each provides a glimmer of socio-technical hope, a concrete and real alternative to what we typically find in making research and other discourses. I argue that researchers and makers can build on amplify and experiment with these alternatives moving forward. Specifically, these glimmers are tied making to democratic civic engagement in concrete and engaging ways. So if IT researchers want to pursue making potentials for democracy in a meaningful way, we hope to have provide some workable images and pathways. Chen's puppet story is one image of many from our fieldwork. 
we identified and interpreted using a critical empirical study of a computational practice in hopes of challenging and spending theory about making and democracy. Treasure Hill showed an instance where a well-meaning government plan led to cruelty and injustice at the site where making is deeply implicated and where free speech and resistance hell give a voice to a marginalized group, though it fell short in the end of a just outcome. None of these images individually constitutes a compelling and viable alternative. It is in their collection and curation that they collectively become able both to problematize current IT agendas and also at least gesture towards alternatives. Thank you. Questions, comments? So, I wonder, um, I have very little knowledge about the video, but last year when I searched some, on some information, the information I thought is they have a Cheddar Hill artist village, which, which is very different from what you showed inside. But how are they just like, Reform that building to a like open community for artists, or like what happened? Now? This is a project that's in the, in progress for for years, and then so what happened that what alerted to us about you know the kind of history of uh, how this um, community come uh, come together is when we actually went to um, Taipei Open Lab and then interview and observe a lot of the making activities in the lab. And then, you know, one thing led to another, they say, you know what, if you are really interested in making, you should really think about how this community, how Treasure Hill actually come to, you know, um, become a thing. And there's a lot of, you know, dark sides of making. And so we have, um, so the, the work that I presented is a combination of ethnographic you know, observation interviews and also a lot of the kind of historical record analysis. So I'm yeah. interested in while they are developing, of course, the artists, Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, there are some residents there. I would say that uh, uh, um, every so often they will have community organized events where they really try to integrate the residents into these kind of, uh, a lot of these kind of art, art events. The issue is a lot of these kind of art installations that happen outdoors are very loud. Um, so it becomes a, 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 a really a, a problem for the residents. So there's a lot of these kind of, you know, cohabitation is not something that's easy to do. So that's why I say this is um, making progress. Yeah. And I really appreciate your presentation because mostly information I read from Trader Hill is most of our artist village, not yes. for the Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, thank you so much. Really, really appreciated the presentation. From a methodological perspective, I'm thinking about how valuable a critique that emerges internally is, so that critique yes. that people can offer based on their own experience, and yes. so rather than the theoretical. Both yes. are really necessary, yes. and yes. it seems you have that located in that anticipatory design. Yes. Yeah. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the emergence of the way in which the design offers opportunities for the critique people experience in their things they're aware of that are wrong about mm -hmm. the culture and what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to answer that on two levels. Um, I definitely agree with you that um, the diagnostic critique does not have to come from the researchers. And it is clearly that, you know, um, from our engagement with people on the ground, even government officials, we, had, we talked to uh, I think the vice um, um, minister of um, uh, the Department of Culture, she was very upfront mm -hmm. about you know some of the the problem that she as a, a, as a policy maker that when she tried to implement, she knows for a fact that's a for, for problems. Um, obviously, um, there's a political pressure to you know um, do things a certain way, but she definitely has that. Um, she's cognizant of the fact that you know, in order to move things forward, 
um, there is some things that uh, they need to take into account, not just on the policy level, but also somebody who actually enact that policy. I will say, to, um, um, <coughs> going back to your question about anticipatory design, um, speaking as a, a researcher in HCI, I will say that um, typically um, we have a um, group of researchers that do that specialize in uh, diagnostic critique, um, and uh, that's more like a STS types of um, scholars, science and technology studies, um, where uh, then we have another camp that is you know, okay, right. making things and the technology is gonna revolutionize everything. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do, especially that's why I, we are um, drawn to this notion of um, feminist utopianism, is they really try to kind of say, you know what, in order to do things right, in order to, um, um, to really think about how you can um, um, make the create a, the, the kind of future where all can participate, everybody, every actor need to go, need to do both. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that really, you know, definitely is the, the kind of thing that I feel like, well, at least for ACI, we need, um, when they are making things, they also need to have that sensibility of the empirical um, kind of reality. Yeah. yeah, I really love this um, idea. I think that it tightly connects sort of our sense of our own experience and meaning is, an, is a constant awareness of what could be better. It's, yeah. That's not that's like right. separate that's from right. the way we experience yeah. things. And so the extent to which a methodology and a research project yes. can not only take that up but double it yes. yeah. so that you're also engaging it, yes. I think yeah. it makes yeah. it incredibly powerful. Yes. Yeah and gives a, a more complex way to kind of engage in that diagnostic critique, yes, yes. which, you know, there's this whole history of British yep. people yep. doing all kinds of diagnostic critique that's <laughs> absolutely yep. disconnected yep. from yep. the experience. I, I also say it's very common for, like, for example, cultural anthropologists and their, you know, a key practice is the you know, kind of reflexivity. But I think it's not just reflexivity about how how you want when you are this, um, in the, you know, in your field site, how how the engagement with the participants actually ch reflexively change you, right. but also to recognize that you know, you know, when you are putting something in the world, you know, a, a piece of technology like Arduino enable robots or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, there's a consequences mm -hmm. to put your work. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I really like this framework of feminist utopia. Uh, what are some of the researchers? Who are some of the researchers who um, I read? Oh yeah, who, who talk about this. Okay, um, I would say um, most of the, I'm also working on a book um, on feminist utopian futuring. Um, so the, most of the people I read, um, they are sociologists, anthropologists, and obviously a lot of the feminist um, scholars that talk about futures and talk about especially the kind of future that's a form of labor, um, that's somebody that you want to create an environment where everybody is comfortable speaking up, you can participate. And it's not so much, you know, um, the plan of the future does not reside in the philosophy king, um, that he or she can actually dictate the course of um, um, the direction, but more about um, something that you put forward and everybody debate and and you know, go forward that way. Yeah. Yes. So um, this this might be the question with, without a real answer, but I'm going to throw it out to you. Okay, I love questions like um, this. <laughs> so taking the the Treasure Hill example. Yep. Um, if we take sort of the same situation and put it in the U.S. or mm. put it in mainland China. Yes. Do you intuitively feel that it would play out any differently? I know there's all sorts of variables, right? Yes. So live, but, yeah. But I'm just wondering what you. Well, I I think what um, is, um the framework. So the work we actually um, combine both the feminist utopianism and also the anthropology anthropological theory of the global, and then the notion of the global assemblages, which is to say that, you know, you, there's no such a thing as global universal, um, uh, but something that's more about, you know, uh, uh, in terms of assemblages, in the sense that everything is situated and concretized in, in a, the, uh, the local um, situations, um, <coughs> political environments, and socioeconomic, you know, ten, um, tendencies. 
So I would say, you know, across the globe, um, this kind of urban renewal project is not uncommon. You know, it happens everywhere. But I do think that, you know, there's something that we can learn and can take away from, um, from um, obviously a case like this. And um, we started, the, because of the, this current grant that we are um, working with um, that supports the, the work in Taiwan, and the, another component is actually um, the making us economic driver in the state of Indiana. Now what we have learned is that it, it takes on a different form and shape. You know, obviously you have different kind of political environment. But you know, I would say that it, if one big takeaway for me is definitely the, the, the idea that um, Things might happen in a certain way, um, and then also, you know, hackers, spaces, people perform to this kind of rhetoric of making and um, economic, um, you know, de de development, you know, rhetoric in a certain way. But I think as researchers or design practitioners or educators, we need to attend to what's unsaid, and then also maybe create. A mechanism or in, 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 um, infrastructure that you know we can make visible something that we don't seem to kind of be aware of in the um, kind of common research language or discourses. So that will be, you know, <laughs> something I think about. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think. Lunch is ready, so why don't we thank you, Shoen, and um, 